can I break the ice by just admitting to people or confessing to people why we know each other and we're helping <laughs> each other? We, we, we may have different stories. I, <laughs> I, I say I know you because I bit you when you were one years old. Oh, really? You know one of my brothers. Do you know what this means? I think it's you. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, our moms, I, th I think they met in nursing school, am I right yes, about that? Yes, best friends in nursing school. Exactly, and I actually grew up hearing um, about Claudia, and you, I, maybe by then you were obviously not living in Toronto, because I was raised, and born and raised in Toronto. For some reason I was not seeing you when I was a sentient, conscious creature. It was a source of frustration for me, because I was in Toronto, but I think our mothers were not connecting. Oh my God. Well, I know there was a period with my, I, I have two older brothers, I think the middle brother is maybe a con exact contemporary to us, and we are extremely close in age of my brothers. You were in a playpen with my brother Rob. Yeah. That I, do. I, I remember hearing that, and my mom talked about how cute that was. I know that when I started to write, I remember my mom telling me that you were a writer all those years later. I mean, I was like, wow, Claudia's a writer. And I, this Claudia who I've never physically seen. <laughs> and the other thing I have to say, is that, I mean, I'm just gonna say this, if you don't mind. My mother would always talk about how beautiful Claudia was. I mean, is this embarrassing to talk about? So my mother would go like, well, Claudia's very, I was thinking, when am I gonna meet Claudia? <laughs> anyway, so, um, uh, by the time, and then I actually did not meet you and talk with you until we were on Skype, maybe two years ago, for a slightly sad reason. My, my mom had ALS and was confined to a bed. And she would, and on my side, yes. my mother had dementia and the loss of my stepfather, so she had, had become somebody who could not generate conversation, but who could participate. So when we were Skyping with John's mom, I was always there to generate the conversation so that my mom could be part of it. That's amazing. And, yeah. yes. and so I remember all of a sudden my mom, I was sitting with my mom, and I would fly up to Toronto to be with her. And with ALS, you know, it's a paralyzing disease, but your brain and your, you know, is, is, is sharp as a tack, and she stayed that way until the end. So it was actually wonderful and fun to hang with her. I mean, it was a, for a sad reason, to put it mildly. But then she would say, okay, I'm going to Skype now with Mary Lou and Claudia. And I'd be like, you're kidding, Claudia. I'm going to meet Claudia over <laughs> Skype. It's awesome. So we got on Skype, and then suddenly we were bitching about our respective novels. <laughs> that was the problem, because we were having trouble. We were having... We were on parallel journeys, weren't we? Yes. Yeah. So, so at what stage, so at, at that period, you had written your... No, you were still struggling with drafts of your book, I believe. Am I right about it? Oh, tell me, tell there me were about. like three years of study struggling with drafts of the book. I think uh, when I met you, I'd already... Um, got the great agent and got this wonderful interest in Hollywood and then was meeting some obstacles with publishers so I was wrestling with the editors and trying to decide if what they were saying was what I wanted to do or didn't want to do and you also were, you were coming close, I think we were both coming close, that sort of soul destroying experience where a great editor loves your book and wait weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks for that email and then it's like no and we had a few of those experiences with him. Yes, because I remember for myself I I had written the damn thing through. My my book incidentally, you, you won't really have heard of it because it was um uh no one would review it. I, I say no one would review it. No no one did review it. I I claim of course because it's such a naughty book. It's a book um, that I decided to write uh, Back in 2009, I started writing that having sussed out, having had a, a feeling on my antenna that male novels were having some trouble addressing uh, their, their male desire for the, for the female love object. It, it, that shouldn't be a controversial thing to write about in fiction, but I had sort of gathered that maybe it was. David Foster Wallace had written his essay slamming John Updike and the male, you know, priapic authors like uh, you know, Norman Mailer and and uh, uh, Philip Roth, you know, these guys that wrote. So, and then I, I, I think I was realizing, reading wonderful novels like David Foster Wallace and Jonathan Franzen and all, all the sort of great, the greats that are my contemporary, they were no longer writing about masturbating into a piece of liver, for instance. They were not pushing the novel as far as that, and they weren't writing low liver. 
and they weren't, you know, and what they were doing was they were being very polite about sex, and it was probably a correct pendulum swing. But it also seemed a little kind of like dull. Like, what if you did try to cause a little trouble? So I wrote a book that actually has a sexual theme, is what I'm trying to say. And it was rejected by 41. And a transgressive sexual And a transgressive yeah, sexual yeah, yeah. theme. Because the girl was a little on the younger side, 17, she turns 18. And a man is tricked into believing that it's his daughter. It's not. She's actually been sent in by a nemesis to seduce him. And he's a good and upright man. It was originally called an upright man, my mom's idea, from the book of Job. I had told her it's kind of a play on the joke. Um, so I'm going to wrap up this nutshell by saying that when I met Claudia over Skype, I was in effect saying to you, my God, I, you know, I, I wrote this thing that a Canadian publisher actually had snapped up quickly at HarperCollins Canada. And, and it had been very, very complimentary in ways that made me think that American publishers were going to go nuts for it. And American publishers are indeed highly complimentary of it in the letters turning it down. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we, you and I. And, and I think so, we shared that like, it's a death now when they compliment on how great your writing is. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's the that, end. That's the, that's the end. You don't want that. You, you were crucial for me because, just in this notion of kind of collaborativeness, because you're a woman, you're a wonderful writer. And, you know, I knew that my mom loved and respected you as a person and as a reader and a writer. I mean, you guys talked about literature. There's no one I respected more than my mother about all this stuff. And so I remember thinking, gee, I would love you to read my book mm -hmm. uh, and give me critique. Because, I mean, I, I was now sensitive. Was my book a bad book for women? Was it bad about it? And I had tried to not make it bad. Um, I wanted to address like the male gaze and sexual desire, but I didn't want it to be a panting, kind of embarrassing male fantasy sex book, anything but. So I remember I gave it to you, and I don't know if you remember, but you, you were like, yeah, no, you, you, you pulled this off. There's a couple of places, actually. Yeah. Where you might <laughs> I just, do remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was, that, that is, um, that, that's actually a gift as a writer when you get a manuscript that's, um, there's no problem with the writing, but you get to go into story and really think, take part what what is making the meaning uh, that the reader is getting, and how is that meaning being conveyed, which is very hard to uh, see when you're the writer um, of your own book. It's, it's uh, you can see a little bit, but a lot you're guessing. So then, when you're reading another writer's book, you can you can actually see it very very clearly. Um, so I felt in a in an excellent position to be able to really communicate to John what he was saying with certain adjectives yeah. and, and, um, and situations, what the subtext was. Um, so I, re I actually loved reading it and then loved thinking about it and then loved thinking, okay, where could you work on it? Where could that switch? Because there were a couple of places where just the use, and even the use of um, certain adjectives too often in a short period of time conveyed a sort of um, ickiness that you didn't want yes. at that point. Yeah. And so it was it was really quite a productive um, experience. It wasn't too much, but it was so much fun to talk about it and get into the nuts and bolts of, of the story. Well, so then I immediately retaliated. Yes. <laughs> I had my own manuscript. And of course, as I'm reading him, his, I'm thinking, Read yes, uh, yes. There was no selfless part about it. And then I got your book, which was like, I mean, my book just hues to such sort of conventional story time. I'm sort of playing the genre, but I'm trying to make it kind of a suspenseful and slightly thriller esque. There's a crime in it, like in other words, a DNA scheme. And things like that. So it, it, it's all these things that are, I don't want to say cheaty, um, because I, I, you know, I, I like the book very much. Your book, on the other hand, is like real literature. It's really awesome and truly imaginative literature because you were writing about, you know, a, a future time. You were writing about an apocalyptic time. All this stuff where you had to imagine your way into, you know, stuff that doesn't currently exist and yet make it relevant to our time is why else would we be reading it. Um, you were projecting yourself into a male character as, a, as the main consciousness of the thing. Uh, I, I was frankly blown away and a little quailed. I was a little embarrassed that I had uh, 
uh, you know, need to read mine. But no, I, I mean, but, the, yeah, but was I, I can't remember if I was helpful. Very, very helpful. So there were, um, although I, I know it, at the end, it, it's fine to give it give certain away, but um, there were precipitating incidents for a, conf a final conflict at the end of the book. And you really questioned, um, questioned the, again, it was like taking the nuts and bolts and question how that would precipitate what happened in the, in the end. Um, in a way that was really like, that was the friction, that was the thing that wasn't working to, to finally get it to the end. So it was really, really helpful. Very helpful. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think writers, it's interesting because, you know, obviously one has one's editor, or has an editor, maybe an agent, let's say, but boy, you get a different thing from a fellow writer, don't you? Completely don't you think? different. So we, yeah. we could speak a little bit about what the kinds of comments we might have gotten from editors, so, because part of how we talked about what we, we wanted to bring to you tonight is to discuss sort of the difficult side of um, writing, publishing, being edited, when, it, when the ride is not smooth. Um, uh, this, this novel, The Mercy Journals, went to one very excellent editor, and that's not here, who really liked it, but she found it claustrophobic and wanted more blue sky, um, which was a puzzling note to get, given this book is written as the um, the journals of a man living in the year 2047 who's a soldier with post-traumatic stress disorder. And he has um, survived the last 20 years by shrinking his world to very small controlled existence. And a woman walks into his world and the lid comes off. So the premise of the book is that he's writing these journals in order to, um, in order to survive suicidal and so he is trying to sneak up on his memories, the memories that are behind this post-traumatic stress disorder in the way he writes until you get to that moment. Um, so it's you know it's not a light it's not a light book. Um, but and then the second there's a real change so the second half really sort of is much more plot driven and just the action uh, carries through to the final result. Um, I had known it was a dark book and, and had come up with a comic relief of a chorus of singing worms who um, beckon our hero to the other side. So they they appear, he hallucinates them, and they're always trying to convince him that it's a party on the other side of the grave. So um, I wasn't surprised that she found it dark. But Blue Sky, it just, it just seemed like such, such an unusual comment. But, I did go in and I rewrote it, uh, and in moments where I thought I could bring more, more to it. And then, um, when she didn't take it, then you're left with this manuscript that you've changed for an editor who isn't going to take it. So you have to reread it and re-own what you want, what you think makes the book better, and then get rid of the things that were meant to please, perhaps, or, or move the book in a direction where the editor would take it. Um, and another note I got was to move the character from the beginning to the end, which completely destroyed all the tension in the end. So I had a you know a difficult editorial ride with editors who were interested but wanted it to be something that it wasn't. And in, I, it's not that I was um, sitting on a high horse and saying you know no, I'll never change my great work of art, but you also don't want to make it worse. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to make that look that isn't what it should be. I remember. And you went through. I think you went through some of that. Too. I, I went through. A, what happened? Well, first of all, I'll just say about your journey with that, because I remember reading it at a stage and thinking it was really, really strong. And I think I guess I had that sort of suggestion. I remember in later conversations we had where you were letting me know that certain editors or people were suggesting these massive changes, and I'm always really leery of that. I mean, unless they're awfully smart suggestions. And I worried for you that you'd get led down the garden path and all of a sudden completely wreck the thing. With my book, you know, I, um, Nabokov is my favorite writer, um, and that's a bad thing for a lot of reasons. Uh, thank God I don't write, try to write like him, that incredibly beautiful writing, which is always painful to watch people 
attempt to imitate, they never can. What it did take from him, though, was a, at least in terms of fiction, I'm a non-fiction writer, but in terms of fiction, I essentially took this notion that nobody's going to tell me what to do with this thing. I mean, after all, it's just a fantasy anyway. The, the, you know, it's just your imagination. Who's going to tell you to change it in substantial ways? But what that means is if you're going to take that responsibility on of deciding that you've done it right, it's going to take you a long time and a lot of work to do it. So this took me five years of writing solidly uh, while also fulfilling a New Yorker contract uh, which for three stories a year. And so it was not easy. It was a lot of work and a lot of pain and blood, sweat and tears. All writers will say that. But what I was trying to do with it was get it to a point where I felt like, you know, Nobody could tell me it was wrong or immoral or bad or dirty or in, in any way. You know, and, and the, actually the suggestions you have were lovely tweaks that actually took it down from my original concept. I started the book thinking I would write a provocation. I actually did want to get up in people's faces and say, come on, let's provoke like Philip Roth did. Let's really, I'm going to push the envelope here and, and like risk getting attacked. What I discovered was that um, we've act, we as men, male writers, have kind of pulled back from those kinds of Rothian or Updikean or Nabokovian provocations precisely because something has changed in the culture. And in fact, you can't and probably shouldn't uh, do what I was at, at first attempting to do, which was to be sort of, um, oh, I, I really was, was being irresponsible, I'll just put it that way. Over the course of writing this thing for five years, I faced up to the fact that I actually had to tamp down these provocations. It was, I had to, and, and what Claudia beautifully picked up on was those places where my, where it was actually residue of my earlier writing of the thing. So these were not big structural changes you were suggesting, they were, they were things about like dialing down these tonal bits that were Again, residue. And you were great on that. And thank God you did because it, it helped the book immeasurably. But my editor in Canada did have one big change that he introduced at the, at sort of the 11th hour. I was actually sitting with my mom, who had now gotten a lot sicker with her ALS, just to kind of narratively link this up. So I was sitting with her, and uh, we were on the 11th hour of the damn thing being published. And my editor called the lovely guy, 64-year-old editor up there in Canada, fabulous guy, Patrick. He said, John, I'm just wondering about something, you know, I'm suddenly thinking, do you think there's any way you could kind of write into the consciousness a little bit of the female character, the seductress, my 17-year-old, 18-year-old girl? And I and I had left her as a deliberate mystery in a way to be, I didn't. Want, I didn't think I could do that, and so I actually said to him, Patrick, interesting idea, I, I sort of see why he would say it, but no, I can't do it. For the simple reason that we, we can't know what she's thinking, because we, we learned later in the book that she's actually been wavering on whether or not to do the seduction. And we, we can't, we're not allowed to know that until about three quarters of the way. So I thought I, and, and then he just said very gently, maybe you might want to just think about doing it. And I, he's like a gentle enough guy that I knew that was tantamount to him saying, Do it. Do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I actually thought, oh boy, so I sort of climbed up the phone and I mentioned this to my mom and she was like, maybe it would actually work. And I was thinking, and then I, I slept on it and I woke up the next morning realizing he was a hundred thousand percent correct. I, I thought it would wreck the book. I thought it would tip the hand if I let the reader know too early that she was wavering. Instead, what happened was, in, and it was easy to do over the course of like a day and a half. I just went in like a surgeon because I always, I had to know how she was feeling all the way through the book. Anyway, even if I didn't put it into the book, I had, I had to know it was just like butter, it just slipped in there. I wrote those things in so effortlessly, and it really it inoculated the book. I think against certain charges that the book is too male. I mean, it showed that I could stretch my imagination into her consciousness, and it just made it infinitely richer and more interesting when the reader suddenly realizes she is wobbling on whether or not to go through with the plot. And it just it added a level of 
suspense of added richness and, and all the rest of it. So I learned my lesson, A, I mean, I should have known it anyway, I'm not the Baku. Uh, I cannot get things right on the first go, doesn't matter how hard I work on them. Editors can be unbelievably helpful. And that was like a rock, that was quite a huge thing to suddenly introduce her internal monologue through the course of the book. Yeah, so yeah, it, it is good to show your work to people, editors, agents, friends, it helps. I had a, a question, how many people here are writers? Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. So what, because one of the things that I wanted to explore also a little here is, um, and th this will also be something we'll want to in a conversation with you about, um, is I think both John and I felt we had these books that we were going to write, and there was there, we were going to not write them. Once, once you get a, an idea and it starts, there, there's a point at which you can turn back on it, but there's another point at which it is almost like a baby, and that you're, you have to get it out. It's you know it's got shape, and to walk away from it is is just too tragic and, and unfinished and um, deadening a thing to do. So I, I knew that this book, which really, in some ways, I, I went a bit insane writing it, and it, uh, it took a lot of my life. But there was, there was just never any question in my mind that this this book was, was what I was going to write. Um, and I, th I thought we, I thought it would be interesting for us because my sense of you was you had to write this book because you sensed a space that had been um, vacated. In, in the writing uh, voice in, in American modern literature, I guess. Um, and I don't think there was a way you could not have written this book. It, it was always going to be the book that you wrote. Well, I remember you and I actually talking about that on Skype, and I yeah. remember thinking that it was great because it sort of pulls for me to keep on trying with my book. I mean, yeah, you know, I had, uh, I had dreamed up the idea years before, back in 2001, when I finished my first novel. And I remember thinking, oh boy, kind of a quasi hoax, incest, father-daughter incest book. Uh, there was a lot of reasons to not dive in at that point. Um, not least of them, I couldn't figure out how I would get the DNA scam to work in any way that was elegant and interesting and not cheesy. Um, but by 2009, I, I had a little window of time to maybe to, to try to you know, write a piece of fiction, get a piece of fiction on the rails. My wife and son were out of the apartment for a couple of weeks. I had just finished a contract in the New Yorker. And I remember I took like 10 days and I wrote like 30 that. I suddenly was exhumed that idea. And it suddenly seemed urgent to do. Because in those nine years, I really did see this inkling I had that male writers were for some reason afraid to write about the, the sort of primary mover of how our species propagates itself, i.e. sexual desire. The minute I realized that a novelist weren't throwing down on that anymore, male ones, in a, in a way that was the real raison d'etre of the entire book, I thought, oh man, I'm going to do this now. So when they were out of that apartment and I committed like 20,000 words to paper, and when I did that, writing day and night, it really in a fever, because I'm not that fast a writer of fiction, that was it was scary to do for the very reason that you're saying, because I knew that once I had that lump of words down, and if I, if they were exciting me, and if they seemed to have momentum that was going to thrust me forward, I was going to have no choice but to finish this thing. Right. Yeah, and so I and I sort of deliberately got myself that point, and I knew it was going to be hell. Do you know, think there's um, uh, there is, I think maybe uh, whenever many people write a book, anyway, there's a element of a, 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 a little element of defiance, a little element of rebellion, and always a, a little part of you wants to take the discussion or the form or the structure of the narrative in a new or different way, which is pushing pushing against what is. Um, I think that is part of the motivation for writing, because you see that there's something that isn't there, and you feel that you can, you can make that thing. Um, <coughs> I have to ask you, what was what was driving you crazy as you wrote the book? You were saying you almost drove yourself a little crazy. Was it in the rewriting part or was it in the original conception and committing and no, getting the first No, I think it's because I, I went really deep into yeah. this character. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, 
us. So the intensity of his world and his experience was 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 a greater intensity than my day to day living. So um, when I was writing it, I was living on one level. And it was very hard to pull out again and back in this this world. Uh, my novel is also a post climate change novel. So I um, read everything that I could about climate change over a period of eight years. And um, also, I have two young sons, so um, I very much had in mind what climate change is going to be like for the next generation, and what a, what story might car help carry that generation forward um, in, into whatever the future might be bringing. So I was thinking from a, an evolutionary point of view, like where how our species might will have to adapt to the old climate change. Um, I was doing all that, and, and, and so the, those are, in, in a way, and then it was trying to um, take all that thinking and really try to get to that Shakespearean level where you've got character acting and story, and it isn't thinking, it's fiction, non-fiction, mm -hmm. non which is its own kind of alchemy. Um, and that the intensity of trying to make that alchemy happen did, was also part of what made me a little bit uh, insane. And now, having gone through all that experience, I, there, there's no part of that I would take back. Maybe some of the rewrites for the editors. <laughs> so I guess if I was going to give advice to to um, anybody, if an, an editor asks you to rewrite without a contract. You might want to really think hard about that. That would be the one thing I think, uh, the one takeaway I had from that process. Um, and I know so, uh, that you know, the, after writing this, I have a hesitation to go back in that deep. I'd like to write a lighter book this time because it was. And I think we both learned a, a very hard lesson. I mean. Your first novel went very well. Didn't yeah, it? it's yes. a bestseller. It sold rights around the world, movie rights. So yeah. yeah, my novel, my first That's novel, was, was nicely received. It came out two weeks before 9 11, which I don't recommend as a marketing strategy if you can avoid it. Um, but it was doing very well until that happened, and it went over a cliff at that point. But it did sell to the movies. It's been all those years since 2001 when it first came out. It has been re-optioned and optioned again, so I've made lots of money. I, it's been, it was sold to lots of languages, and and again, it got really nice reviews. So my feeling about fiction was, oh gee, when I get around to being able to write my next novel, won't it be fun? Like, a, you know, there'll be like movie options, and then four and so it's gonna be great, you know? And um, I think you and I both learned on, our, on these novels that it, it, it can right, really novel. be a brutal punch in the face. Yeah. It could be really tough. I don't know about you, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say this is going to sound Pollyanna-ish, um, but I think as an artist, as a creative person, you, you actually learn, I mean, I mean this, I'm not saying this, I'm not the first person to say you definitely learn more from when it goes hard, right? When it goes fat, you, you learn, uh, when it all goes smoothly, what, what have you learned? Like nothing, and, and uh, I don't know, or, or maybe I'll put it to you as a question. Do you think it was something good that you learned from this experience, or, or not? As a novelist, you know, and going into the next one, and whether or not you even will, can you face doing it again? No, I can't face doing it again. See, it, now that's a hell of a thing to learn yeah, after. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, totally, and, and this did get um, quite well reviewed, so... Um, yeah, that's true. I'm you, kind you, of happy about that. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, so what, what was the question? Oh, what did I learn from this experience that I didn't from the first one? Yeah, well, in a way, what was different was the first book I, I um, got in a bidding war and snapped up, and it was really like being princess queen for a day. So it was a whirl, and, and you don't know really what's happening. But this book, because I, I got to the point where I was really fighting for it, and I knew exactly what it was, and I felt passionate about it. So it had like to me. This book is for now. Um, I I got much better fighting for for the story and knowing that this was my story and going out and talking about it. So it did make me stronger. There's mm -hmm. no question about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How are we doing?
looking for time. Going for like another 10 minutes? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, I know for, uh, for myself, I mean, it, it is funny just in, just in terms of the fact that I'm now, as of last week, going to be writing a nonfiction book. So I'm able to step off of this, this fiction, this terrible fiction thing. Uh, that the center of fiction is and named after. I'm a little after. bit envious. <laughs> I'm a little bit envious. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm a little bit relieved, actually, because in, in the last uh, in year, I, I have been sort of whipping my soul, saying I, I insist on writing the next novel. I am going to write one. I, I'm going to write one precisely because this one is so hard. I mean, 41 rejections from publishers in the, in the States um, rejected across it was bought by Japan, and as of a few weeks ago, uh, or months ago, by uh, the UK. But that's not what, there's a lot of countries out there that also said no in droves. And uh, I was determined that I, to, that, that, you know, I wasn't going to let this bother me. And in fact, I was going to write something more outrageous, something that really got up in people's faces. Um, now I've been relieved of that for, at least for the next little, <laughs> The next little while, because I have to write this nonfiction book. Um, but I, I think meeting resistance is, um, you know, it, I, I, if nothing else, it shows you whether or not you will get back on the horse, whether or not you actually are committed enough as a fiction writer to, to get on. I mean, I, I, you didn't take it as hard as I did, maybe. I mean, you, you were not as roundly rejected, perhaps, as I was with my own. I never counted, so oh, you count. <laughs> I don't you know. Yeah. It was, uh, I know it was three years of a real up and down, like hope and then not, not, yeah. and then. Which is damn different than a bidding war for your first novel. Very That's different. That's rather experience. extraordinary. Very different. Right, so you do get to know why you're really well you're writing. Do you think we should read a, a little? Yes, by all means. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to, do you want to start? I can. Okay. Is that all right? <laughs> I haven't a clue. Okay, so that'll give you a little. Yeah. Um, so I'm, uh, I'll just read right from the beginning, and then I'm going to keep it short because I think readings should be short. <laughs> um, me. On October 15th, 2072. Two moleskin journals were found wrapped in shredded plastic inside a yellow dry box in a clearing on the east coast of Vancouver Island near Desolation Sound. They were watermarked, mildewed, and ragged, but legible, though the script was wildly erratic. Human remains of an adult male were unearthed nearby, along with a shovel and a nine millimeter pistol. Also found with the human remains were those of Cooper. The journals are reproduced in their entirety here, with only minor copy editing changes for ease of reading. Journal 1, March 9, 2047. My name is Alan Levy Quincy, age 58, born May 6, 1989. Resident of Canton Number no. Three, formerly Seattle Administrative Department of Cascadia. This document, which may replace any will and testament I have made in the past, is the only intentional act of memory I have committed since the year 2029. I do not write because I am ill or because I leave much behind. I own a hot plate, three goldfish, my mobile. My Calibo Life, my Beretta M9, the furniture in this apartment, and a small library of 11 books. And then yesterday I was in Chicago um, doing a reading with another writer, and as you all know, there's been an election. Um, <laughs> And one of the reviews for this book was, was that Trump's wall foretold. Um, in thinking about, so what I've done with this book is, it's, it, I'm not saying it's a prediction about the future, but I've compressed 200 years into 30 
five years of help and something like that as to what would happen. Um, while I was writing this, I, I, w I was on a plane with a, a young man who uh, was a soldier and who worked for the UN um, doing security for the International Criminal Court. And he had an expression that um, very much confirmed my thinking in this book, but I, I think many of us, and I don't know if this is true for New York, it's definitely true for Vancouver, where we're with the ocean and the mountains and nature's around us, but um, thinking about survival, I mean, it's no surprise that there's been all these survivalist movements and people back to the land thinking if they can live in a subsistence manner. Anyway, this uh, soldier said that we are uh, three meals away from chaos. And I heard that as it really captured me, and I asked him what it meant. And he said that in the, in the military, um, they learned that uh, uh, any society is three meals away from chaos. What that means is that when people have missed three meals, and they know um, there's no meal in sight, so there's no sense that there's going to be more than meal. They start the, the fabric of society starts to unravel, and they you know they start to panic. Things start to happen. Um, in the world, in a, if climate change is dealt with, there's going to be increased pressure on um, borders because of uh, water and food and resources and conflict. So I imagined. Um, that Canada and the U.S. would quickly become one country, and there would be a wall with Mexico, which would be in a, in a drought. So um, I'm going to read just a one page of this. I know there's somebody here who may have, a, you know, who might find this difficult, and just feel free to leave. But it's going to be a short um, section that feels um, of the moment. So this is my character, Alan, Alan Quincy, is telling, he has moved up to the point where he can talk about uh, what's caused his post-traumatic stress disorder, and he's telling a woman about it. But it's got, this is a, a layered structure, so he's writing about telling the woman about something that happened in the past. So there's three levels of time going on um, in this scene. As I paused in my telling, just as I pause now in my writing, I breathed in, then jumped headlong. Uh, so I, I will say, so he was the leader of a, a company of soldiers uh, sent to the border to guard it. Can you speak up just a little bit? Okay. Um, on our second night, the Mexicans blew another hole in the wall. Amid the swirling smoke and dust lit up by our floodlights, a man walked out of the darkness and stood in the new breach. He was covered in dust, and his face was shadowed by a hat, a cloth hat with a wide, soft brim, like a gardener's hat. We couldn't see his face, but we felt him looking at us. No one moved. We waited. Then he moved his hand, very slightly, and people began to stream out of the darkness behind him and walk past him through the new hole. They were silent in all that wind and dust, with all the orders being shouted and guys yelling. You could hear that they were silent. Our orders were to shoot anyone breaching the wall. The floodlights exposed them, women, children, old people, sons, daughters, expressionless, focused only on getting through and disappearing into the darkness on our side. When we saw it with civilians, I ordered my company to fire warning shots, but the people didn't even slow down. I was getting orders on my headset to stop the motherfuckers, and I was yelling back that it was kids and women and old people. Stop them. I don't care how, but stop them. No one crosses. 
called out a warning in English and again in Spanish, but they didn't even look up. I shouted an order to my men to use non-lethal force. Our first shots were to legs and feet, and a whimper went through the crowd. But people just lifted the wounded under their arms and carried them forward. Someone must have told them not to run, not to panic, not to scream, that their only hope was to just keep walking forward. Other units were firing at other breaches along the wall, and we heard a C6 and an FN mag open fire. I prayed for the crowd to turn back. I shut my eyes and pleaded with the universe to turn them back, but of course it didn't. They needed a drink of water. They needed food. They poured through, hitting for darkness, while the man with the hat stood looking at us. The ma major on the other end of my headset demanded to know what was wrong. Stop them, or I'll stop you. I wish I could tell you I said to go ahead and stop you. I flipped the switch. I wish I could say it was my training that kicked in, but it wasn't. I felt rage. Rage that I was in that position rage that my men were. There was anguish and pain and horror, but on top of that, there was rage, and it was coalesced into one thought, make this stop, shut this down, end it. We took out the man with the hat first. All night they kept coming, as if they thought we might run out of bullets. They had to climb over bodies to keep coming. It goes on, and I'm not going to read uh, too much more, but in a sense, of uh, that scene. So that's the scene that undoes my character. Well, that's fabulous. And, and you know, it's funny because I have been thinking about how your book, uh, frankly, you know, Adam Braden foreshadowed some of this uh, apocalypse we now find ourselves in, the, the, the Trumpian moment. Um, and I, I don't think that type of thing is, is by any means coincidental. I, I think in a strange way, writers, if they're tapping into the uh, universe, uh, they're, they're picking up the vibes. They're picking up the vibes. And um, my book, you know, I, I did wonder, you know, how is a, a kind of sex, uh, provocative, com comic, thriller-esque tragedy, book of Job kind of thing, you know, in any way of this moment. Um, and in fact, Really, I, I don't even know how to word this so I don't sound like I'm trying to say that I was in any way agreeing with Mr. Donald Trump. Um, but I was picking up on some level that some degree of, of extra care that all of us here in New York that work in publishing and, and write fiction, that all of us were being ever so very, 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 very careful with what we said to the point that we were maybe shutting down our, our own voices. We were not risking a whole lot. Now, I, I sure as hell don't uh, endorse the notion of a guy, uh, you know, addressing our world, our country, uh, in, in the kinds of tones that, that Trump is. But certainly some large swaths of the country, were, you know, heard something there. Uh, you know, this anti-PC thing that, you know, was supposed to be or not we, but some people are applauding in the end. Some, some, something was in the air where people were looking for a provocateur, let's face it, that's who just got elected. And my book, I realized, my God, it's, it's about a guy in a trailer park. It starts with a guy in a trailer park. Uh, no, no money, no future, no hope. He's a bad dude. Uh, he likes girls that are too young. And he's watching a show that emanates from one of the great elite centers in New York City uh, with an Oprah-esque host who's extolling the virtues and praising this paragon uh, of correctness, my, my hero Jasper, who, whose wife has had a terrible stroke and uh, she can't move, she can only communicate by blinking and they have a, a young child, daughter, who's four years old and the book begins. So my, my, my angry white guy in a trailer park is sitting there watching this rich, 
successful writer guy being praised on a TV show out of New York. And he's thinking, man, I'd like to take that guy down. And I, I only, only in the, after the Trumpy moment do I realize that this is, this is the dynamic we've just seen played out. So he actually hatches a scheme. He thinks, that guy's not better than me, God damn it. He, he, I'm hearing that he's the greatest husband in the world. He looks after the stroked out wife. But you know, given half a chance, he, he'd be as bad as me. Now it so happens that his girlfriend, Chloe, it is, you know, uh, a very attractive and seductive young woman. She's actually quite a sweet person, too, as, as we find out in the book. He does manage to manipulate her into um, posing as the daughter. But she has her reasons for doing that. Um, so I think I'll do what, what I probably shouldn't do, which is actually read the climactic scene. She's been sent in to, to, to seduce the, the father, the good man. Uh, she's been living with him now for some, at least a month and a half or something. And finally, all the planets line up. Um, the stroked out wife has ended up having a medical episode and she's off at the hospital. The caretaker of the four-year-old daughter lives in a, another building on the, on the grounds. And the four-year-old daughter, missing her mom, who's gone off the hospital, has said, can I sleep in, with the caretaker taker in the house? So now the husband finds himself alone in the house for the first time with the 18-year-old girl that's been sent to seduce him. She's been working on his nervous system now for quite some time. And our hero is in a, a heavily kind of stripped down emotional state because the wife has had the episode that got her in the hospital. And he's now come home from the hospital where the wife is almost dead. He comes back. His watch read 11.05 when the cab pulled up in front of the house. The night was pitch black, and at some point it must have stormed because the air was charged with strange electricity, and the human maple overhead was still ticking with droplets from the downpour. He might have had difficulty <coughs> seeing the flagstone path had not someone left the porch light on for him. An oily gleam lay on the dark stones. The rest of the lights in the house were out. He opened the front door with his key. Stepping into the dark foyer, he saw that he was mistaken. The dull glow from the lamp illuminated a part of the living room. He called out, hello? No response. He moved across the unlit foyer. Arriving at the threshold of the living room, just in time to see a fleet, spectral figure, Chloe, rise from the sofa and run off toward the arch door at the end of the room. He called out to her. She stopped and slowly turned, sniffling, dabbling at her eyes with a dabbing at her nose with a balled up tissue, she gazed at him. She was dressed in a pink teddy, its hem gave grazing the tops of her bare thighs. The low light of the lamp shone through the gauzy fabric and revealed her body within. What he at first mistook for the three white triangles of her undergarments were, he realized with a shock, the tender areas of naked, unbronzed flesh that had been covered by her bikini during her backyard sunbathing sessions. Her hair, damp from a shower, lay in shiny, ribbon-like coils around her shoulders, which were bare but for the thin straps of her nightie. She flushed at the sight of him and said in a small, halting voice, trembling with suppressed tears, I couldn't sleep. I was worried about Mum." He took a few steps forward into the room and stopped. They stared at each other, a long minute of charged eye contact. She said in a voice barely above a whisper, I poured you a drink. She glanced at the coffee table. His eyes followed hers. He saw a stubby glass with an inch of brown liquid in it. A nearly full bottle of scotch stood beside it. I thought you might need one, she said. There followed another extended moment of unbearable eye contact. Then they moved toward each other, like combatants in a gladiatorial arena, clashing for battle. But when they met in the center of the room, it was to cling to one another, as if for solace in their shared grief. Poor mummy, Chloe said, in a hot rush of moist breath into his ear. Poor mummy. I know, I know, he said. He pulled back his head and looked into her face. She drew her lower lip under her two front teeth, biting a little at the tender flesh, pulling its delicate vertical creases smooth. She lowered her eyes, then raised them again and stared searchingly into his. Her gaze, for all its softness, cut into him, into his soul, which, in his grief and guilt over Pauline, felt like a howling vacuum. She tilted her head back, her face back, allowing her mouth to fall open and her eyes to swoon closed. Suddenly he was kissing her, feverishly, hungrily. He greedily sucked her tongue into his mouth. He could taste the salt of her tears along with the toothpaste flavor of her saliva. 
With his hands, he molded her back, her tapering waist, sweeping his palms down over the sliding fabric of her nightie and cupping her buttocks. He felt one of her nimble hands snake down his flank and slide between their bodies, over his twitching lower belly, her cool, tickling fingers, blindly groping their way into his waistband, then finding and cl closing around his flaming member. She squeezed and he shouted, Oh, God! His legs nearly giving way beneath him. And they wouldn't even publish it. <laughs> you gotta wonder. You gotta wonder. I was going to follow up yeah. a little. Yeah. Uh, um, so I've, I've read your book and thought about it. I would counter that uh, something that is nothing to do with political correctness, actually, that you're reacting against. I think political correctness is another word for manners, for living together, for having empathy for each other. I think what you're talking about is when it is self-righteousness, which is something very, very different. Correct. Correct. And I think the two get mixed up. Correct. So I, I Sanctimonious self. Sanctimonious yes. and self-righteousness. Yeah. And those two are equated, and they're not the same thing. Because um, I actually would be a strong proponent for political correctness. I think it's right. I think we need it. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't need any self-righteousness, and we don't need sanctimonious. And we don't need, need that sense that anybody's perfect, anybody doesn't have deep, primal, um, you know, unfiltered thoughts and feelings. And, and, in, and, and so I would, uh, you know, fight for your right yes. to, well, to go to that place. But I wouldn't say it's got anything yes. to do with political yeah. correctness. Correct. I mean, and, and I would be somewhat facetious and ironic in saying that. Yes. Because Trump has gone. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. You do it. I welcome we it. We need No, you're quite so. It's important. Quite so. I, and I and I also think we need novels that take us to uncomfortable places. We and, do. And that look at you know uncomfortable emotions and and stuff that makes us feel awkward and and so on. Yeah. I suppose it, one of the the common threads, and then we're going to open it up to questions. But one of the common <coughs> threads was that. I felt um, post 9-11 that the, uh, the way the media and many people talked about genocide, talked about war, and talked about terrorism was as if only other cultures would uh, commit such savage acts. Only you know, countries in, in Africa or Germans or Japanese would commit the genocide. Um, and I, that really, really bothered me. I, I felt um, very strongly that that behavior, that genocidal behavior, um, is something that's deeply um, part of who we are as human beings. Um, my first book was uh, had a, a lot about evolution, human evolution, and it ended up while doing the research. And I think now this has become a story that many people know. Jane Goodall, when she was studying chimpanzees, because they're the closest to humans, and any behavior we have in common with chimpanzees is behavior that would have been present in our ancestors. And she witnessed one band systematically wipe out another band over a period of months. Um, and she was shocked. She was utterly shocked. But it, it shows that that behavior, under pressure, in circumstances, in certain circumstances is a human behavior. So in writing this book, one of the reasons it's in the future was I wanted to write a genocide that happened in North America. Now, I mean, you could write about the way First Nations people have been um, treated, but I didn't want to go there. So that's not what was how it happened in the future. But I did, again, want to get past a sort of smugness in our culture and in our history that, no, we're, we're not like that, because we're in it together. If we have any hope of limiting that behavior, controlling it, or being able to um, foresee it and fence it in, I think we have to understand more deeply where, where it fits inside all of us. So I think that, that was, you know, maybe politically incorrect, but I wouldn't say it's about that. It's really about um, understanding and on that light note, <laughs> um, 
Oh, I'd love to open it up to questions. I'd love to, we, we would love to hear where people are at with their writing and what their yeah, struggles, yeah. questions, dilemmas. They want to walk away, give it up, going. That's why you might have Trump is going to have to do. My challenge as a writer is just writing, per se, just finding a place where I just sit down and write. My question I'm going to talk to you is this. Long hair or tight? Tight hair. Do you want to take it first? Sure, I do both. So I um, I probably start off writing on a, a pad of paper yes. and, and get a chunk and then I input it into the computer and then Correct. there's when you do that input you find out what you bought, you rewrite it and you start shaping it. Um, and then if that keeps flowing you do that. But I uh, I think this could be useful to a number of writers is I'm never blocked. If you get to a place where you feel like you're blocked, uh, what it means is you're not asking yourself the right question. Because in a way, writing fiction is really a series of answering questions, <coughs> posing questions and answering them. So I set up two or three pads of paper beside the computer, and I'll, I'll, I'll figure out what it is that's blocking me. I'll write down something on one page of question, and then I'll start just writing out the answer to that. and then sort of free hand. So it's a space that's a free space, very uncritical, unmonitored. It is in the test, and that's where you can make your discoveries. So I think it, it's really quite useful to have sort of your more codified text that's, that's um, getting to your final form, but also having this place with, for me with pen and paper where you can just keep, keep a free open field to work out problems. I, I'm just tight to this one. I, I, I was just yeah. always on the field. Yeah, I mean, I would carry a notebook around if I was walking somewhere and would have a sudden thought about it. So, and sometimes it's an actual phrase or a transition. I would pull that out, jot that down, so I would at least remember it. But yeah, it, it mostly happened on the computer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You bet. So I'm not a writer, and maybe my question will betray that. Um, and if it's rude to ask a writer this, I apologize. That's I have a question for you, John, because it's a very foreign experience to me. Um, what can you tell about what is behind your need to be provocative? Because I don't get that. Yeah, boy, good, good question. Um, I, I guess it comes down to what I, I I like when I read books. The books that I like, um, or like the most, let's say. Push, push me in uncomfortable directions, or I end up, I guess I admire these writers that I sense uh, marched off in a really tough direction. It doesn't have to be sexual provocation. I mentioned a number of authors that went there. But, you know, Leo Tolstoy writing The Death of Ivan Illich, which is about a man who realizes that he's got some, some degenerate, it's probably cancer. And that, that rather short, novella, I guess, or long short story, just relentlessly forces you to look into the horror of your own extinction in a way that I've never seen equal. Um, and to me, it seemed like a provocate. That it seemed to me, a, what it really seemed like was a kind of honesty. Just, just, and that's what I thought uh, literature has to do. I certainly thought that uh, John Updike, in, in certain of his novels, not all of them, um, Nabokov was a, was someone that seemed to me to be brutally honest, uh, without fear or favor. Um, so maybe maybe I, in using the word provocative, maybe it's not right. But just sort of like a ruthless honesty about the human condition, if I can sound self-important, um, and and not let yourself shut anything down. Like say all all bets are on. Just let's let's have it all. The risk taking. Yeah, risk taking. Just just going for it. Uh, is, because the rest of the time we're so clamped down, you know, we have to be so polite and, and behave so well. We really do have to in order to get along in society. But there is another part of us, a crazed, wild, untamed beast. Um, I think we've also noticed that recently. Uh, that's struggling to get out, too. Might as well let it go in fiction and fantasy. I have a question. Sure. You're kind of, so at what point 
do you think that that wild side um, might end up hurting people, like poisoning them, rather than opening their eyes to um, make things better for everyone? Well, we're living in a real moment where people fear that, like uh, where you know there's there's sort of a uh, you know warnings and so on, you know triggering trigger warnings and safe spaces and stuff for people like yeah, because it's understood that that art and literature, and I rather like this idea that it can, as you say, poison. That's an interesting thing, like that you're actually going to introduce something into someone's system that that could harm them. Um, you, you certainly can't worry about it. You know, you, you, um, that's really maybe up to publishers to worry about it. They were clearly worried about it with this book because they said it, it cannot be published, it cannot be read, it must not see the light. And when it did somehow wriggle into the light through a tiny publisher in California, you know, really, I, again, it may be just the paranoia of a writer that feels rejected, but nobody reviewed it. It was written about in the New York Times, a feature story about kind of my struggles to get it published, because that was sort of an interesting tale of where are we now in the culture. That sort of attention in the New York Times would ordinarily lead, just, just by you know, the way the New York Times sort of sets the cultural agenda, would lead to reviews, which would then lead to readers finding it. I got one review in the Huffington Post, and otherwise this thing was ignored. And I mean, again, it's my paranoia. My belief is, frankly, that it was felt that it would poison people. Um, but I, I think we can't worry about poison people. I think maybe we need to try, for all I know. I, I don't know. You know, um, yeah. Um, I was curious, um, with both of you, when you get so involved in your character, I think I read a piece that said you were, you were really involved in this man. Uh, and then you finish, right? So where is he now? Yeah, he's a, he's almost like a very close relative when they die, a close friend when they die. They're with you, they're with you forever, and he, he's definitely going to be with you forever. So, so, so then you say, like, so he's dead, so he doesn't go on. No, no, he doesn't go on, it's, it, there is a, there is a closure, it's, it's over. So no, he doesn't keep sort of having his life past <laughs> this, it's over. So it's, it is, it's more like when someone has died, they're still very present with you, but the story, that's, the, their stories come from it. The meaning of it can sort of change looking back, but the story goes over. Mm -hmm. It's a great feeling when you know you've created someone real enough that they sort of seem like they're in another room. Yeah. It, it's the person you made up in the book. But, and, when, but, and when you're finished, what happens? What happens? Uh, well, this will be a confession of how I think with this particular book it was a little more schematic. I wanted to present two sides of the male character. Um, a man that behaves extremely well towards a, a deal in life and is faithful and good. And another man who's just total evil. And that, I, to be honest, I probably shouldn't be admitting it, but the, 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 both of those characters were extreme enough that I'm not sure they seem to me like fully real characters. I'm just going to open the admit it. But it was also part of the scheme. It was part of what the what the thing was. I mean, the same way as a Bible story or a, or a yeah, parable. Yeah, each book is a different thing. Yeah, exactly. Different thing. Yeah, and there's fa fairy tales where we don't think that, that the characters are necessarily fully grounded. My first novel, written in the first person, much more autobiographical in a way, although it takes off into kind of areas that are not like my life, Cal, who's that guy, is so real for me. He's so real for me. He does like live just in the next group, you know. He he like I know him. I just know him. And and people's reaction to the book uh, suggests that as well. And I've had people say to me, "You should write a sequel to that book and bring it back." And so yeah, it's a great feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you Although don't get I, it. I find it takes a long time for the characters to really arrive. Oh yeah. Maybe not not your two characters. <laughs> <laughs> Sing. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's, it, the, the struggle is to make them into real people like, on some level. But um, yeah, yeah, but they come in, they fill in, sort of almost from the bottom up until they're there. I will say this: I'll, I'll, I, weirdly enough, the character I was most worried about, and the one that I worried that I sort of didn't feel like I worked on as hard, was the girl. Yeah. 
the weird thing, she's the one, if, if there's anyone that lingers in that book for me, it's like the rounded character who had the most moral dilemma yeah. of whether or not to go through with this seduction and so on. And she starts to see him as a real father because she's an orphaned person. She has all this kind of richness to her character. Even though you wouldn't call, I wouldn't call her the, one of the main, it's the, the two main characters seem to be the two men. Right. But lurking in there is a girl that actually seems very, is very real to me. Yeah, actually, she's in another room.